Let us pray. Thank you, loving Father, for your matchless grace. <clears throat> the more we come to understand it, the more overwhelmed we are by it. And the more we are overwhelmed by it, the more we respond by thanking you and just accepting that grace and living in that grace, exploiting that grace to the full and telling others of this wonderful grace. Help us to appreciate it more even as we study this hour in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've come now to the what we would call living grace or its post-salvation grace. And we talk about logistical grace, which needs a definition. <clears throat> Logistics is a military term which is a reference to the science of supply provision and planning of troop movements. And it really is an all-encompassing word. Included in the definition would be the handling and implementation of personnel. It involves the design development acquisition storage movement distribution maintenance evacuation and disposal of materiel it even includes housing and hospitalization for personnel it's a technical term for sustaining and supporting troops in every form of military activity and in so adapting this word to grace, we, it's, it's a, the perfect word to describe a living grace for the believer. For it takes place after salvation. And it's everything that God can do. And if, if this is all that's required for handling of uh, troop movements, Certainly, the Bible definition of the divine planning, divine support, divine provision, and divine blessing for the execution of the protocol plan of God for every member and that means every member of God's royal family so that each one can fulfill God's purpose for his being alive on the earth at any given point of time. Now, God's logistical grace includes three factors. First of all, it's life support. This explains why you are alive today. There's only one reason you're alive, and never forget it. Every day that you wake up, never forget the fact that you are alive today because of the grace of God. It's God's grace that keeps you alive. You haven't earned it. You haven't deserved it. 
You haven't merited it anyway. And there is no work under God's heaven that can keep you alive for one moment of time once God is finished with you. We are alive today. We live, we move, we have our being because of His matchless grace. And if you face difficult times, you remember that His grace in eternity past knew every possible contingency of life and in His perfect plan and in His perfect grace, He has made absolute and total provision so that there is nothing in all of the world that can possibly happen to you which is beyond His plan and which has not uh, been provided for in the grace of God. There are times when we become very subjective in life and we see the difficulties and fail to realize that this doesn't take God by surprise. We worry because of, uh, and we'll look at it, the logistical grace rationale, which is one of the doctrinal rationales which is necessary for you to understand, particularly under uh, phase two of the faith rest life. If you don't understand the logistical grace rationale, you don't have one of the problem-solving devices of the Christian way of life down. Because the second problem-solving device is faith rest. But just to know faith rest is not the problem-solving device. Because the fourth point in the, in the, uh, in the doctrinal, uh, in the uh, problem-solving devices, the fourth problem-solving device is orientation to doctrine and orientation to grace is number five. Those two uh, become a part of the second problem-solving device in which you utilize the rationales to think through the various doctrines while you're going through great difficulty. And when you do, you find that logistical grace rationale teaches you that there is never, a, there is never any excuse for the believer worrying or being anxious about anything in this life. And when you do, you're out of fellowship because it is a mental attitude sin. When you're out of fellowship, you are carnal, you are controlled by your old sin nature, you are not controlled by the Holy Spirit, you are resisting the grace of God, you are uh, failing the grace of God, you are falling away from the grace of God. Oh, these are words which we will look at as we study. But God's life support system is responsible to keep you alive. And, beloved, it's, a, it's, it's designed for the believer who's in fellowship as well as the believer who's out of fellowship. It's God's providing for you to keep you alive in the devil's world so that you can go positive toward doctrine and grow in grace. But even if you don't, God's logistical grace is as good for the person who is filled with the Spirit and is in spiritual maturity as it is for the reversionistic believer who is in total apostasy. And that's hard to understand. It's very difficult to understand for the self-righteous legalist because the legalist wants to say, you mean to tell me that after all I've done to get to grow spiritually and to come to this place that I'm no better off than the person who is in total uh, reversionism and apostasy not as far as the grace of God is concerned. Because God's grace is not earned by you, nor is it unearned by Him. God's grace is not measured by merit or demerit. God's measure, grace is measured by who and what He is, and not by performance. Furthermore, the second factor is blessing. God does not bless on the basis of earning and deserving. Whether you're a winner or a loser, in or out of fellowship, obedient or disobedient, whether you are uh, uh, good or bad, whether you're spiritually mature or in reversionism, God's blessing is for you in, under logistical grace exactly the same. Now, there are such things as escrow blessing. Now, escrow blessing is an entirely different thing. 
And that goes along with the third phase of, uh, of living grace, which is super grace or multiplied grace. Once you have reached super grace, there are blessings which are in your escrow account, which God will see that you get, that are over and above the blessing of logistical grace. But the blessing of logistical grace is for everybody. Here's the reason that this works. Well, let me give you the third one, and then we'll go on to the, to the reason why it works. He also is, gives divine provision to execute the plan of God. Those are the three factors of logistical grace. Now, winners use grace. Losers coast on it. But it's the same grace that keeps us alive. Now, the, ba the basis for logistical grace, and this is what we must understand, is known as divine integrity. Now, the integrity of God is also known as the holiness of God, but the, the, too many people have destroyed the meaning of holiness. And therefore we don't use the word holiness very often. It's, it's a, it is the absolute righteousness of God plus the absolute justice of God. These two are His holiness or His divine integrity. Now, we also call it His, his divine virtue. It's a description of the very character, the basic character of God. Now, we must uh, therefore understand that God is sovereign, absolute righteousness, justice, love, eternal life, omnipotence, omnipresence, omniscience, immutability, and veracity. God loves his own integrity. That's one thing. When we love ourselves, that is a factor in self-esteem. Spiritual self-esteem gives us the proper kind of love for ourselves. But the Scripture teaches us that there's nobody who doesn't love himself, which means that so much of the self-esteem teaching today is phony because it's based on the fact that some people do not love themselves and it's that's not true it doesn't make any difference it may appear to be that way but that's only human viewpoint God tells us that there's no man who ever hated himself there is nobody now God when it says that God loved his when we talk about God loving his righteousness and his justice or his own integrity we under we understand therefore that the importance of his righteousness and his justice. And here's the principle. What the righteousness of God accepts, the justice of God blesses. What the righteousness of God demands The justice of God administers. And the basis of the integrity of God working on behalf of the believer is simply this. Because of the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary, God's absolute righteousness is imputed to the believing sinner. This is a judicial act. It's a charge. The righteousness of God is imputed to the believing sinner so that now this believing sinner 
is declared plus R, justification. Therefore, the justice of God must bless the righteousness of God wherever it's found. And since the believing sinner is declared righteous, and this is not an experience. This doesn't have anything to do with how you live. It is a judicial act that takes place at the point of salvation on the basis of faith in Christ. Therefore, since you have been declared righteous, whether you are experientially righteous or not has nothing to do with it, the justice of God must bless this righteousness. And as a result of this, you see, whether you're good or bad or in or out of fellowship has no bearing on it. The fact that at the point of salvation, you received justification by grace through faith. Now you are the object of what the justice of God must do. Since the righteousness of God has accepted you, the justice of God must bless you as a believing sinner. Now, this is, of course, positional. We remember that, or uh, always positional, positional truth. But positional is very, very important. The first three chapters of Ephesians deals with our position, the last three with our experience. The first, 12, uh, uh, the first 11 chapters of Romans deals with our position, the last four with our experience. This is true of Colossians. The first two are, experience, are positional, the last two are experiential. The whole book of Hebrews, until you finally get down to the 13th chapter, is all positional. Then you finally get down to experience. But the point is that God's divine, fantastic wisdom has found a way to bless the believing sinner without any relationship to merit or demerit, ability or lack of ability, human perspicacity or lack of it. And that's the reason that every church-age believer, regardless of who he is or how he lives or what he deserves, is going to be the recipient of the blessing of God. Romans chapter 3, verses 22 to 24 says, But now a righteousness from the source of God apart from the law has been made known to which the law and prophets testify. That refers to the Old Testament. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. You see, there is no, we love to take this next verse out of its context. There is no difference for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, comma, and we are declared righteous to all who have come short. We are declared righteous freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Therefore, 2 Corinthians 9, 8 is true. And God is able to make all grace abound, or overflow is really the word, uh, better translation, uh, to you, so that in all things, at all times, having all sufficiency, You will abound in, we could say all, or every production of divine good. You please notice that the believer's sufficiency is not qualified by prosperous times. You have sufficiency in all things at all times. There is no historical disaster there is no physical problem. There is no crisis, circumstance, or situation to which this does not apply. This ought to be the first verse that every believer learns once 
they have finished the verses on, on to understand what happened in salvation because this passage is fantastic. There is nothing that is left out of this. God's grace overflows in all things at all times, giving you all sufficiency to provide for you the production of every bit of divine good. It's just a fantastic pro promise from the Word of God. Philippians 4.19 is a familiar verse that people love to quote, and it's true. My God will meet all your needs according to His glorious riches in Christ Jesus. David understood it, uh, logistical grace, in Psalm 37.25 when he said, I was young, now I am old, yet I have never seen the righteous, that is, those with imputed righteousness, forsaken, or their children begging for bread. Jeremiah wrote Lamentations, chapter 3, verses 20 to 25, as Judah was receiving the administration of the fifth cycle of discipline. They were going through a tremendous historical disaster. And he says, Surely my soul remembers... And then the context tells us what, what his soul remembers. He, uh, you see, his, he had outward affliction. Fantastic outward affliction. And he also had inward turmoil. But he says, Surely my soul remembers and is humbled within me. When I remember these things, I am oriented to grace. That's what produces humility, see. This I recall to mind. Now, the this is described in the next verse. Uh, this is the thing that's going to cr crowd out hopelessness and helplessness and self-pity and uh, 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 weeping and groaning. See, lamentations, the word lament, lament means to cry. Going through a time of weeping and crying, and going through this weeping and crying, looking at your outward circumstance and your inward turmoil, there's some, there is hope, however. This, he says, I will recall to mind, and therefore I will have hope or confidence, faith under pressure. Then this is what he remembers. Because of the Lord's grace, we are not consumed. The word uh, is mistranslated is chesed. C-H-E-S-E-D-H. -E -E and we've seen in the doctrine of grace that this is one of the Hebrew words for, for grace. It is, because of the, uh, it is because of the Lord's great grace that we are not consumed, for His love never fails. They, the two things, His chesed and His love, his, uh, the, the, He says, they are renewed every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Therefore I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, logistical grace for the day. The Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait patiently for God to act. The Lord is good to those who have faith under pressure, the one who seeks Him. In other words, every morning they awaken, they recognize the plan of God, they recognize that logistical grace support is there for the day, and they relax in who and what God is. It is logistical grace, beloved, that is the basis for the perpetuation of our lives in time. No matter what disasters, no matter what difficulties, regardless of the satanic opposition, and remember 1 John 4, 4, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Never, never put your eyes on Satan. Never have your eyes on what the, the damage that he can do. Never be obsessed with uh, demons or demonology or the occult. Just relegate those to the, a place in your doctrinal knowledge because you know the solution. The policy of evil, opposition from other people, our own tendencies towards self-destruction, all of these things are insignificant compared to the logistical grace that gives us the assurance 
that day by day and with each passing moment strength I find to meet my trials here. We are the product of logistical grace. Now, the support that God gives to us is in several areas. The first area is life-sustaining. Now, this means exactly what it says. No believer will ever depart from this life until God gives you the permission. Unless you superimpose your will over the will of God in what is called suicide. Which is a terribly cowardly, self-centered way out. And it is total rejection of the plan of God total rejection of the provision of God, total rejection of the grace of God, you'll still be saved because of eternal security, but you're failing to understand that God is in command and His grace is sufficient. God's, in fact, God is able to extend the life. We'll see a passage or two on that later on. He is able to extend your life so that He can bless you longer in this life. There are certain things He can do for you in this life that He can't do for you as far as heaven is concerned. There are blessings which He can give you here that He cannot give you in heaven. One thing is blessing under suffering. There is no suffering in heaven, so He can't bless you during suffering. But He can bless you during suffering here. But all the forces of hell can't remove one believer apart from God's permission. And he'll support your life. Psalm 48, 14 says, This God is our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even unto death. Then there are temporal needs. We all need food, shelter, clothing, transportation, environment, time, a job, all of these are a part of his provision of temporal need. Matthew 6.33 again says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's imputed righteousness. It's not experiential righteousness. And all these things shall be added to you. Now we're going to take that text in its context because that's the context for the doctrine of logistical grace and the logistical grace rationale later on. But understand this. Again, I, I always hear these people uh, who are saying, oh no, uh, I did this because of who and what I am, or, or you know, it's, it's my strength that has gotten all of this for me. Uh, it's my, my wisdom, my smarts. After all, I'm the one who has the intelligence to hold this kind of a job. I'm the one who has the physical pers uh, ability to handle this kind of a job. But you see, you are looking at it from the wrong viewpoint. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, the uh, deuter is the word for second. Uh, namas is the word for law. This is the second law. The, the giving of the law is repeated in a second time with a little more amplification from God. Now God says this, in beginning in verse 7, For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with streams and pools of water, with springs flowing in the valleys and the hills. Just close your eyes and we'll open them again afterwards, would you? But just remember, just think of these things. A land with uh, springs flowing in the valleys and hills, a land with wheat and barley, vines, fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil and honey, 
a land where bread will not be scarce, and you will lack nothing, a land where the rocks are iron and you can dig copper out of the hills. Beautiful land. Now, have they earned or deserved this land? Of course not. If they deserved anything, they didn't deserve this. This was God's grace blessing. Now, verse 10, when you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, his decrees that I'm giving you to this day. See, otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Now notice the number of times the word he appears because this is a reminder that they are total products of grace. He led you out through the vast and dreadful desert the thirsty, waterless land, the, the venomous snakes. He brought you water out of the rock. He gave you manna to eat in the desert. Now verse 17. You may say to yourself, My power and strength of the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. And multitudes of men and women have thought, It's my power. It's my strength. It's my ability that has produced this for me. <clears throat> but remember, the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you ability to produce wealth. Let me ask, what does it take from God to remove the whole thing. One fell swoop. One touch from the judgment of God and it's all gone. You've worked hard, you say, it's laid aside. Be, you'd be surprised how quick it'll go. One illness can wipe you out financially, completely. Until you come to the place where you're laying on your back, looking up at the ceiling, and you realize that you've got nothing left but God. And you'll always have Him. No, you say, my job, that's up to me. No, it isn't. It isn't up to you. It's up to God. Now, this proves, all of these things prove that God's grace provides for much more than our needs. Most of us have a lot more than we actually need in all of these things. But His temporal grace blessing provides for us. The third thing that He provides for support is security provision. Your security is from God, not from your employer. Your security is from God, not from the government of this nation or any other nation. Do you realize that everything from the moment you were born has been provided for you from the guardian angels that protect you in the angelic conflict to the wall of fire that he places around you to the hedge which he has built to protect you from satanic intervention in your life to, to your, for your spiritual advance to, to eternal security with regard to salvation which tells you that you cannot under any circumstances lose your salvation 1 Peter 1.5 says we are kept by the power of God so you rest today 
Of course, as good citizens, we are concerned about uh, who will be elected or who has been elected and who is going to be uh, leading. But our security doesn't depend who leads. The nation of people, are, this nation will get the kind of leadership it deserves by the election that it by the the choices that it makes during the election and america today is suffering because of stupid decisions which have been made as far as elections are concerned somewhere along the line americans have been fed the phony idea that it is more it is better for a nation to have uh, a Congress of one party and a, an administration of another. That is absolutely erroneous and fallacious. That is the worst thing that could happen to a nation. That's why our founding fathers said that the House of Representatives should have two-year terms, because if you don't like them, you can get the bums out of there. But at least, at least give the administration the benefit of having the uh, Congress which is supportive of his programs and in four years if you don't like what they have done throw the whole thing out and put the other party in but don't try to have two parties working in the same uh, situation they can't do it because the old sin nature will not let them what one proposes the other will oppose in order to gain the upper hand and say I'm the one who has done everything for you. And we are reaping today the, the, uh, the sorry situation of a divided leadership. And I don't have much hope that the American people are going to wake up in the next election. It may be. But I, I don't see many signs of it today. But they'll get exactly what they deserve. In the meantime, our security doesn't rest in who's in Washington. Our security rests in who and what God is and His matchless grace. D, there are spiritual provisions. The spiritual provisions are the logistical grace and, uh, provisions for your advance spiritually. This includes the laws of divine establishment, the completed canon of Scripture so that we have the Word of God in our hands, the local church as the classroom for your spiritual advance, the spiritual gift of pastor-teacher so that uh, the pastor-teacher can communicate Bible doctrine for your spiritual growth, a human spirit for the storage of Bible doctrine so that uh, you can be filled with the knowledge of Him, a spiritual IQ which is unrelated to your human IQ, but it is the, the amount of scripture you have inside your soul, the privacy of the priesthood so that you can receive Bible doctrine for yourself and not be intimidated by other people, spiritual discernment which comes and spiritual power which comes from God so that you can advance spiritually, free will and volition so that you can make your own choices and the necessary decisions to put doctrine first in your life. The provision of the ten problem-solving devices of the Christian way of life. I mean, all of these things are spiritual blessings. And it's a fulfillment of Ephesians chapter 1, 3, which says that God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. E, there is additional blessing. Escrow blessing, which will be discussed later. That is, super grace blessing. And then God prolongs life and pre preserves us from death. I'll give you the passages. You can look them up. Psalm 68, 19 to 20, and Psalm 79, 11, and Proverbs 14, 27. Now let's just take our Bible and turn to the doctrinal Rationale for logistical grace, which is found in Matthew chapter 6.
Beginning in verse 25, we have the logistical grace rationale. Now, this is what the believer will think. The rationale is a thinking process. A pro it, it, ra talking about rationality is talking about the uh, function of the mind. And this is what the mind can go through whenever you are uh, tempted to worry or fret or be concerned about these things. And Matthew, 25, Matthew 6, verses 25 to 34, outlines this for you. For this reason I say to you, stop worrying about your life as to what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor for your body as to what you shall wear. Is not life more than food, and is not the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They do not plant, neither do they harvest, Neither, neither do they store in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of greater value than they? Never look at a bird without thinking of this passage. Whenever you see a bird, think of this passage. There ought to be a tremendous occasions for you to then use the logistical grace rationale because... There are sparrows everywhere, even in the middle of the winter. Now, going on, which of you, by worrying, can add one moment of your to your lifespan? This is not, it doesn't say, uh, really, the, uh, most of the King James and many translators say, add a one uh, 18 inches to your, to your stature. You, can you add, can, by worrying, can you add 18 inches to your height? That's, that's not what it really says in the original. It says, how, uh, by worrying, can you add one moment to your lifespan. Now, that's a little... Uh, most of us are, are trying to do that all the time. But worrying, we're trying to add a moment or, or two moments to our lifespan. And we do, we, by thinking carefully, we hope we're, uh, we're maybe going to live longer because we... Uh, uh, cut this out or that out of our life or something like that and we're willing to make those sacrifices but you know he says this why are you worried about clothing observe the lilies of the field how they grow they do not work neither do they spin in fact I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory did not clothe himself as one of these and if God keeps clothing the common grass of the field and he does first class condition which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace Will he not do much more for you, believer of a little faith? Therefore, do not worry, thinking, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal, or with what shall we clothe ourselves? For all these things the Gentiles search for eagerly. We'll say the unbeliever, although most believers do too. Furthermore, your heavenly Father knows that you have need of these things. Remember the these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, imputed righteousness, the basis of logistical grace. And all these things, logistical grace support, will be provided for you. Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will take care of itself. Each day has enough evil of its own. Four times in this passage we are commanded not to worry. And the reason you're not to worry is logistical grace. The grace of God is designed to carry you. And we know from this passage that logistical grace is without measure. God does not mete out logistical grace in miserly amounts, uh, he have causing us to uh, come back again and again and again for a penny at a time. He, he gives it in abundance, far more than is necessary. 
And then remember this, when our Lord Jesus Christ came, He did not take upon Himself the form of a bird. Now you may think that's blasphemy, I'm telling you something though. He didn't take, himself the, the, he didn't take upon Himself the form of a bird. Why? Because He didn't come to redeem birds, they weren't important to Him. What did He come in the form of? He took upon Himself the form of someone who was important to Him, man. And if God takes care of something who is not important to him, a bird, how much more will he take care of someone who is important enough for the Lord Jesus Christ to come in the likeness of a man? So the logistical grace rationale teaches us, beloved, that fear, worry, anxiety, apprehension are all rejection or ignorance of God's logistical grace provision. You know what the most enigmatic thing about this is? That even those who worry, fret, and, and are anxious, and are filled with apprehension, God still gives logistical grace to them. You see, if I were God, I'd say, well, all right, if you don't, if you want to worry, go ahead, but I won't provide for But God doesn't do it that way. He provides logistical grace for the worrier and for the non-worrier. Just because you worry, you're not going to cut yourself out. I hope you won't worry because logistical grace support supports the believer even when he's filled with fear, worry, anxiety, and apprehension. And why worry when you don't have to, when God has provided for it? But logistical grace uh, 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 emphasizes the principle of living for today and fulfilling the principle of living one day at a time and living that day as unto the Lord. Then there is the, the a fortiori argument. Now, our a fortiori Uh, in in uh, uh, debate, there are different kinds of arguments, and the uh, fortiori is uh, simply means uh, the stronger, from the stronger to the weaker, or from the greater to the less. And the point is this. Uh, if if God does the greater, then it proceeds from the a fortiori argument that he'll certainly do the less. And the a fortiori argument uh, is given in our fortiori argument is given in Romans eight thirty one and thirty two, where he says, "Therefore, to what conclusion are we forced? Since God, on behalf of us, who can be against us? The greater to the weaker." If God is for you, and He is, first class condition, if God is for you, well, the lesser is going to be, oh, you don't worry about anybody else, do you? And He goes on. Who can, uh, the God who did not spare His own Son, the greater, but delivered Him over to judgment on behalf of us all, how shall He also not with Him in grace give us all things? If He gave us the most in giving us God the Son, the, it's nothing to keep us alive. If He's provided for your eternal salvation, it's nothing to keep us alive. Nothing at all. Now, beloved, if you have trusted your eternal destiny to Jesus Christ, if you have trusted Him with your eternal salvation, what else is there to worry about? How can you worry about daily living when you've trusted him with eternity in the future if if you can't trust him with your daily life how can you trust him with your soul for eternity I don't know since God gave us eternal salvation in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ then he is, something is, is much more certain than that. And that is, 
that logistical grace for living will be provided for us. The issues, that is, these are the things which issue from the logistical grace rationale. Logistical grace is the basis for our stability in time. You're not up and down, up and down with how you feel. Emotions are most untrustworthy. You cannot trust your emotions. You'll be up and down, up, you'll, you'll feel good. And that's, some churches actually pray on that, P-R-E-Y. They want you to be up and down as they get you up and down. Logistical grace also provides the momentum for spiritual growth. Why, you stop to think, why have you, have you kept me alive here, Father? Why have you provided these things for me? If I thought that the only reason God kept me alive was so that I could take up X amount of space on this earth, I would say my life has no meaning or purpose or definition at all. I don't have, what, what am I alive for? But I realize I have, uh, that God has a purpose for me here. And he's keeping me alive with logistical grace for a purpose. And I, I want to fulfill that purpose. I want God to take, and I'm not asking that he make a big impact or a big splash. That's not the issue. But whatever it is he wants me to do, that's what I want to be, I want to be found doing. What more does he ask of a faithful steward that when, when his Lord comes, he finds him so doing, that is, functioning in the capacity of the faithful steward? See, logistical grace continues. Even when the believer is in reversionism, God does not withhold grace on the basis of demerit. Well, there are a number of passages that we will look at very uh, briefly when we come back as the biblical documentation for logistical grace. And we'll uh, look at some of those uh, as we uh, move on and get ready for our next facet or the next increment in our study. Now, thank you, Father, for this fantastic logistical grace which you have provided for us. Thank you that again and again you have provided that which we need, that which is, is even beyond our needs, keeping us alive in the middle of the devil's world for the purpose of our spiritual advance. We are total products of grace, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.